Welcome to Ray of God. Ray seeks to share feminine spiritual wisdom to help realize God in all ways and to align with justice, truth, and beauty. The energetic state of the feminine is our guiding principle and holds our intention. And we believe that all genders hold the feminine and the masculine within themselves. And while we are women-led and women-centered, we welcome and encourage all genders to join us in helping to create safer, more inclusive spaces. So I'm delighted to be continuing this month with our Ray Reads session, a monthly book chat with fabulous cohort of authors. And our book highlight this month is Among the Eunuchs, A Muslim Transgender Journey by Leila Yagiela. And I'm just going to read the blurb for those of you who probably have um, read it, but I'll share it again here. From an early age, Leila Yagiela knew that she would be defined by two things, being Muslim and being trans. Struggling to negotiate these identities in her conservative, small hometown, she traveled to India and Pakistan, where her life was changed by her time among third gender communities. Known as Hijras in India, Khwajasaras in Pakistan, these marginal communities have traditionally been politically and culturally important, respected for their supernatural powers to bless or curse, and often serving as eunuchs in Mughal India's palaces. But under British coloni colonization, colonia colonialism, never can say that, the hijras were criminalized and persecuted, entrenching taboos they still battle today. Among the eunuchs reveals vastly varied interpretations of religion, gender, and sexuality, illuminating how deeply culture informs our experiences. As identity becomes an ideological battlefield, Layla complicates binaries and dogma with her rich personal reflections. Her fascinating journey speaks to all who find themselves juggling different kinds of belonging. And for those of you who have joined us before, you know that Layla has been part of each of our previous Ray Fests, and I'm delighted to welcome her back today. Welcome, welcome, dear Layla John. Thank you very much. I'm very, very excited to be here and to be able to talk to you about my book. So I shared um, a little uh, um, kind of review on my on my Insta yesterday, and I said that um, I was that person that kept asking Layla, "When is your book going to be finished?" <laughs> and you know, and I should know better. I'm a publisher, and I know that when authors are in their final stages, that's the thing that they don't want to keep hearing from. So I apologise to you in person now, Layla, for for bugging you, but I'm very glad that your book is out now, and. Um, yeah, I just wanna wanna just dive str straight in there. I've read it twice now, um, and I know that I'm gonna I will, I will go back and read it. Not only is it such a beautiful expression of your journey, um, which you know there is there's so much with the struggles with you know finding yourself, finding your voice, finding your connection to God that I know will resonate with so many people, but also your you know, the way that you go through the historical um, uh, references in such an engaging way, you know, it's, it's not dry at all, even when you're talking about the historical aspects of it and the way that you merge it together is so, is so wonderful. And I thought maybe an opening point would be, you do, you do discuss it in the book, but you are a, a cultural anthropologist and it seems to be inextricably, you know, woven into your journey. But maybe you could start off by sharing how you found that to be your calling. Oh, uh, good question. Um, I, I, I don't even know whether it actually is my calling or not, because I also, um, I, I, I love being an anthropologist and I, I love that I had the opportunity to study the subject at university, the opportunity and also the, the privilege. Um, and uh, at the same time, I'm also struggling with anthropology because as so many academic disciplines, anthropology is of course, it, it has this colonial inheritance, it has the imperialist inheritance. And uh, even though a lot of anthropologists like to imagine that somehow they are above that and beyond that and they've done all the critical thinking on that subject i don't think that is really true and there still is a lot of um 
a lot of racism, a lot of colonialism, uh, and also a lot of uh, a lot of queerphobia, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of supremacism of all kinds in in academia in general and in anthropology as well. So I I always struggled a bit with what anthropology is supposed to be and what it is and how I can be an anthropologist. And it's also one of the reasons why currently I'm not um, I'm not teaching at a university anymore. I consciously decided um, not to to have a classical academic career at some point in my life. And I also wrote about that in my book, pretty much I think in the in the preface, I um, I already uh, hinted at, at that whole struggle. Uh, nevertheless, I think, well, the, the thing is, what is important for me is that my interest in anthropology has a lot to do with my 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 becoming as a human being, so to speak, and my own my own questions that I had and still have about identity. You know, um, I I grew up as a child um, that did not feel much belonging in, in society. I didn't feel that I belonged to mainstream German society. Culturally, I didn't um, I, I I didn't feel that I belonged to the usual ideas of gender and sexuality. Um, I started to identify as a Muslim very early on in life, but that also further raised questions about belonging. Do I fully belong to the Muslim mainstream community? Um, as a Muslim, how can I still be a Western person, a European, you know, and all of that. So um, from a very early age on, belonging was a big question for me and it still is today and I, I think belonging is also the big question of anthropology so my interest in anthropology was was um was inspired by this or caused by this and at the same time then later my academic education as an anthropologist also informs how i um, how I deal with these questions and how I deal with all all of these issues. Um, but the the crucial thing is, of course, that in in academia, even though there is a bit there is a practice in anthropology of you know questioning your own positioning and and um, being aware of it and talking about it. But in the end, of course, you have to be an academic, and then you have to. Um, you have to present this all in some kind of, uh, you have to analyze it properly and then present it in some kind of way that can claim at least some kind of um, academic objectivity. And, uh, and, and, and suddenly the, the people that you encounter in your life as an anthropologist become the subjects of your research. And, that is a position that I've never felt very comfortable with um, because uh, going out into the world, understanding other cultures, understanding the potentials, the negative and positive potentials in other cultures, in my own culture, in, in life, in the human condition, does personally, I feel it does not allow me to think of myself just as the researcher and the others as my subjects, but I, I feel we try to figure out life together. Oh, that's so beautiful. And I feel like that's something that comes across so strongly in your book, that you're not being the observer kind of, you know, like measuring right this experience that's happening outside mm -hmm. and i just wanted to touch upon I, I i underlined a lot in your preface um but i particularly you know just based on what you've just said i wanted to highlight this on page um i guess it would be 21 in the preface um so you talk about the the hijra and kwajasara community and you say i do not want to speak for this community but i want to speak about my own encounter with it and i want to write about what such an encounter has to say about the world we live in and its obsession with difference and identity. And 
you continue to always reflect back that you don't want to be caught in in this um, observer, you know, measuring the other throughout the book. And I, I, I just, it, it really touched my heart, the, 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 you know, the almost pains that you went to, to kind of like be questioning, you know, why you are doing this and not wanting to be othering the community that you are also part of. And what a kind of double bind that might, might, that must be in that when you're in it, you feel this is your community. But then when you're writing about it, sometimes there is this kind of looking at the, the whole spectrum of the community and where they fit um, in the different spaces and through and through time, then also connected to your journey, you know, as, as a child and the different ways that you've connected. Um, I thought that was a really, I don't know if that was an intentional, but a beautiful kind of juxtaposition, you know, of how, of how you're showing that. And I wonder if you could speak more to that. Yeah, definitely. First of all, I'd like to say, yes, I mean, not being an observer, um, but also at the same time not claiming, you know, this thing about not speaking for the community is also about not claiming to be the representative member of the community because I'm not that either, you know, uh, and I write about that as well, that I'm I'm not in a position at all to speak for this community or to speak about that community. I can only speak about my own experience and that experience has been a complicated experience from my childhood on as far as belonging is concerned. And what I just mentioned that I, I didn't feel that I belonged in German mainstream society. I didn't feel I belonged in the Muslim community fully. I didn't feel I, um, and, and then I probably hoped that when for the first time I went to, to India and encountered this community and then later also spent more time in Pakistan with the community, I probably hoped that I could find that sense of belonging there that I, I didn't have here in, in the West, but um, I, I didn't completely find it there either. Yeah, there are things I, I now understand that there are um, different sources in my life that inform me. Um, and one of the most important sources, of course, Islam to me. Um, but there are so many other sources in this global culture that we live in that, that inform me. And uh, the community, the Khaja Sara community is one of those sources as well that informs me just as so many other cultural and religious and spiritual sources that I write about in that book. But neither do I fully belong to any of these sources, nor can I speak for any of these sources, nor do I, well, what I think is that we, we live in a world in which more and more people now find themselves in exactly this kind of situation, you know? There's more and more migration, there's more and more exchange, um, there is so much, to, just through the internet, there's a constant flow of, of information all across borders and from culture to culture. And we all live in this complicated world now where so many sources of knowledge inform all of us, where we all have, or at least a lot of people that I know and that you probably also know and that a lot of the people in the audience know, um, people who have different belongings, you know, who can't just say, I am just this, you know. Um, and that is even true for, for the Khaja Sara community in South Asia now, you know, just as I am um, a European Muslim who traveled there and who lived there and who learned from the community, you now, of course, have, well, you have the internet there, you have TikTok there, you have YouTube there. Uh, people take their information from that. Um, you also have a lot of Khaja Sara activists and also Indian Hijra activists who go to international conferences all over the world in Amsterdam and the US and Bangkok, you know. So it's, um, we all suddenly are faced with this reality of, of having the of moving in, in multiple spaces and in multiple realities, also in contexts in which um, in which we suddenly become somebody else, you know? Because being a transgender woman in Western society is not quite the same as being a Khaja Sara in Pakistan, but still there are a lot of people on this planet now who 
can be the one in one context and the other in another context. And that's the this particular moment in time that we live in that's so fascinating and where we have to ask ourselves, okay, what does this mean for identity and belonging as such? Thank you. And, you know, it brings me to an, another quote as, as you were speaking again. Uh, this is uh, in the unbearable whiteness of being, page 55, where you're talking about belonging. And at the bottom, I double highlighted this bit for because I really felt it for myself. And you say that I have often felt that if there truly is a space that I can belong to, then it will always be the space in between. That is as much true for my experience of gender as of culture. This space in between does not feel like the cosmopolitanism or world citizenship that some people have professed to belong to. Rather, it feels like a wound, but there is no way around that wound. The best I can do is make it visible and write about it. And I just, first of all, it really spoke to my heart about this wound and how we deal how, how do we deal with this? Do we cover it over? Do we try to ignore it? Or do we do a courageous thing, which is to really, you know, shine your own light on it, but then make it available to anybody else that may also benefit from it. And it really reminded me of um, Rachel Mann's book, uh, Dazzling Darkness, because she also speaks a, a lot about the wound and bringing the light to it, primarily for, for oneself, for oneself's own healing. But then we're also interconnected as human beings that sharing stories can can bring healing to others. And, and I wondered, you know, as much as, as, as you're able to speak about the effect of having written your, this, this story down, you know, at this point in your life and any feedback that you may have got from other people about the similar wounds and the healings that they, they may have received just from hearing your voice. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people give me very similar feedbacks to the one that you just gave me, you know, and I, I find it very touching and very, um, I, I feel very blessed to hear these kind of um, things about my book. And especially I feel very blessed that I, um, I, I hear these kind of things from people who may not necessarily be transgender, for example, you know, who may not necessarily be queer. Of course, I get a lot of positive feedback from from queer transgender muslim people as well but I, I i get it from a lot of people who who just also understand that um despite despite the title of the book this is not simply a book about tr being transgender or about queerness or anything like that but it it speaks much much more about this situation uh, of our world at the moment and 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 as I said, the question of identity and belonging as such, I think um, and that may also be the reason why Rachel's book also resonates with that theme to to some extent. I think that of course we as as trans people are um, much more critically and also in our lives much more you know, at a much much more early age, exposed to these questions, we we really cannot e escape them, and um, that is why why this is such a good. I mean, e either either it's a point of crisis and of failure, and it completely destroys you, or it is a good starting point to deal with this larger question uh, of identity in life and. Um, yeah, but in in the end, even when we talk about gender and sexuality, I I strongly believe that um, the the so-called transgender experience, the experience of not fully fitting into a gendered box or into a sexual box, is in the end a very very human experience. You know, I I I think the well the percentage of people who who particularly identify as transgender is very low, but I also think that the percentage of people who will say that they never had questions about their sexuality or their gender, um, or who, who always felt that they can perfectly adapt to all expectations regarding their sexuality or, or gender, that number is 
is maybe even lower than the number of transgender people in society. So even that issue is one that should speak to all people. And I, I wrote my book with that goal in mind. I, I wanted to express exactly that. I wanted to tell people, look, this is not the story of some freak of nature, but this is this is the story of the human experience. I, that definitely comes across, and you're just saying that, you know, you, you say in your book also that there was a study done, you know, was it maybe the 90s where people were asked, you know, kind of what, what are your views on sexuality, and there was a lot more ambiguity with people within themselves, whereas in a more recent study, there seems to be kind of like people maybe they're not sharing as much, perhaps, well, and they I'm do not, have these I'm, questions. Yeah, I'm referencing the Kinsey studies, yeah. and they, they are from much earlier a date even that was the 1950s or 19, 1940s mm -hmm. which is quite astonishing because we think of that time as a very sexually repressed time and of course it was i mean the rules of society were very strict at that time and um, but it's interesting that just precisely because the social boxes available for your sexuality and your gender were not that well defined at that age as they are now, you know, we now have a term and a box and an identity for everything. But um, people, in, in many ways, people as a whole, as a society, were much more queer than they are today, ironically. I, I think that is that is really fascinating. It's almost a sense of, you know, we assume that things have become, become more fluid. And yet, actually, there's a kind of undercurrent kind of backlash to that, where people have become yeah. you know, more rigid. And you, you speak about that in, in your book. I just want to also, I forgot to say at the beginning, friends, if you have any questions, please do post in chat. Um, and hopefully, we'll have time to take some questions at the end as well. So um, we'd love to hear from you, whether you've read the book or not, anything that comes up for you in this conversation. Um, so, so coming back to the terms, you talk about this in your book, You know, the fact that you decided you were very particular with the title that you you used uh, among the eunuchs and you know you you go through you use all the terms that you know could possibly have been used to reference uh, third gender um and i find it really fascinating that you say that so i'm looking at page 74 that even uh, in pakistan where people might have used shemel it's they've been taught that it's now not an appropriate uh, term and transgender has become popularized and again, back to these labels and the ways that we fix ourselves. Um, could you say a bit more about how you've seen these these terms change? And also, you know, a little bit about your decision to stick with with the title for this book uh, and any feedback that you may have had from from editors or friends about about that. Well, um, first of all, I, I, I just said this a few days ago in another interview that I, I expect to get cancelled at some point because of this book title. I totally do. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't I don't mind. Bring it on. Cancel me, please. But you haven't you um, haven't been cancelled so far. And I think no, this, I is, so this far. is doing exactly what you what you wanted to do. It's creating a conversation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It doesn't. It, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It, it creates a conversation. Um, it doesn't, but it doesn't have the shock effect that I actually thought it would probably have because I, I do understand that a lot of people, in particular trans people themselves, would have an issue with this because we don't want to be called eunuchs nowadays here in this society. And also in, in South Asia, it has become very unpopular now to use that word in English, um, even though the Pakistani. Urdu, uh, politically correct word, Khaja Sara, actually literally means the same thing, but still uh, there is a different ring to it, a different tone to it. Um, we think of eunuchs as castrated men. This is the image that we all have on our minds. We think of, of the, the slave trade, uh, men who were abducted into slavery and at a very young age were forcibly um, castrated and then served as eunuchs in, in palaces, not only of Muslim polities, but all over the world. Um, and that is part of the reality and that existed and it's part of South Asian Muslim history as well. But um, the term eunuch originally was used in a much, much, much broader way. And it was used actually to 
to uh, signify all kinds of people who did not fully fall into the gender binary. Um, and among these were these castrated slaves, but there were also people who we would probably call um, intersex, and there were people who we would call transgender. And that is how this category was, uh, was understood as one somehow, even though we think of intersex and transgender and castrated men as very, very different things, but according to the constructions of gender in the past, they were not that different from each other. And that tells us something about um, how, how culturally contingent our identities and our categories of gender are, that the way one culture or one point in history thinks of gender is not identical. You know, there are no ultimate truth about this. Um, and of course, we today now, we, we, we think we got it, we have the truth, you know, we finally understand how gender and sexuality works. But well, first of all, we see in society that we can't even agree on that. There are many different truths at this point in time. And also we can be very sure that in maybe already in 50 years or in definitely in 100 years, 200 years, again, people will think completely different about these categories of gender and sexuality. And that is why this, I, 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 I like this title actually, because it, it immediately hints to that. And then of course, people ask me that question, okay, what, what about the title? What about eunuchs and trans women and all of that? And then I can, I can talk about these things. Um, I think my editors didn't have, that much of a problem with the title because of course as uh, you, you know publishing business Saima and <laughs> of course publishers also they like titles that are a little bit provocative and you know they catch your eye so I think they were fine with that um, I I had had arguments with some people um, activists on this subject um, but also I I I know that, I mean, that there is no term that's not contested, you know? When we look at the South Asian community at the moment, the vast majority now, especially the people who engage with, the, with NGOs and with Western donors, they have adopted the term transgender because it is a word that's, that's you know, it, it has global currency, so to speak. It's understood all over the world, but, I know members in the com of the community who say, no, I, I don't want to be called transgender because transgender is something else. It's something different. It's, it's a different concept. And we have our own identities as Haja Saras. And to us, these histories, the, the histories as, you know, being, uh, being, being working as eunuchs, in the palaces and at, at sacred sites of Islam, that is more important to us than being identified with some kind of global transgender story. So um, th there, is, there is never a term as politically correct as you want to be. And I, I do think there is something to be said for political correctness and for using the right words for people. But, but in the end, the, especially in this field, you, you will have people who will disagree with whatever language you choose. We have here, we have right here in, in Germany, we have a group of people who insist that they want to be called transsexual and they don't like the word transgender, you know. Um, you have else, else, elsewhere in the world, people who now find transsexual very offensive actually. So um, it's, it's never easy to, to, you know, you, we can't speak perfect language on these issues. Um, but that is precisely what we should be aware of. We should be aware of the fact that language is always constructed um, and that our concepts are also constructed. And, uh, and then we should just try not to be hurtful and insulting and, yeah, and address people accordingly. I, the other thing that I, I love about the title as well you know, it's a sense of like, you might not know that you are among the eunuchs. And the reason I say that is because the description that you give of eunuchs, especially, you know, um, from an Islamic perspective, is that 
it was something that you somebody decided for themselves and there's something so beautiful in that simplicity of somebody choosing and then it's accepted you know and the, the people that join these the communities of you know the hijraza quadriceras that that person is is saying that you know um i choose this and then that's it that you just you, people, when you went to the shrine if some, when somebody asked you you know are you of the third gender and you you say yes or you say no and it's accepted that it's it's so it seems so simple and i you know on one hand I'm, i don't want to some people could take this the wrong way and get scared like you know oh like you know we could be among the eunuchs at any point but yeah it's, it's this is humanity we are all human and like what what is it that we're relating to on each other how much do yeah. we need to know about each other and i felt that that came through so beautifully in your book yeah. i have the way to that you explain though, that i have to say though that those choices are more and more contested these days and i find it also very shocking that i mean my 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 book came out uh when exactly december 2021 i think yeah. um and ever since there has been an onslaught of of transphobia in pakistan that did not exist at that point when i when i published the book i i wrote a little bit on that in the book about these new changes in society and you know but it didn't exist the way it exists now now we have a very very wild discussion in pakistan in particular on who is a real khaja sara who should be allowed to adopt that identity in in the name of islam and it's very mixed up with that global discussion also it's not just a purely muslim or pakistani thing but it's you know informed also by by the discussions that we have in the uk now for example or in the us and suddenly people start questioning these self identifications um and that it, it it's scary that this this happened in the course of just two years and it really wasn't that much of a thing before just in 2018 in the pakistani parliament um a transgender uh basically an anti-discrimination law for trans people and khajasaras passed uh in in the parliament and it was very much a law that focused on self-identification, so very much based on their traditional understanding. And even the Islamist parties at that point said, yeah, that's fine, we, we accept this law. Um, and now suddenly it's an issue, you know? I mean, that was 2018. Now we just have five years later and it's an issue. And it's, it's, it's scary how quickly these things can change. Um, in traditional South Asian Muslim culture, this is this is a total. It's an innovation because we do not find anything of that in the pre-colonial Muslim past. You know, we know that um, when the British came, uh, the Victorian British uh, colonial regime, they couldn't understand this this business of Khajasrath and eunuchs and and. Uh, they forced on um, they forced examinations, medical exam examinations on the eunuch servants of the Muslim aristocracy, and and were shocked that the Muslim aristocracy did never bother. You know, I, I mean, they they didn't care to investigate what the genitals of these people looked like or what their biology was. That was a colonial British concern. The, the local Muslims never, never thought much about that. If a person presented as a Khaja Sara and behaved as a Khaja Sara, you know, and unless there was some something fishy going on, you wouldn't you would just trust that person. But colonialism brought this idea that um, we cannot trust people like that. We have to do some medical examination first. And now we have a global discussion as well, who also, which also says we cannot trust these people. They could be sexual predators. They could be fake transgender people. They could be this or that. And suddenly this is a thing in Pakistani society. That's very worrying, the kind of you know, quick developments that we see both globally, but also in, in those contexts. 
I guess that's the downside of living in a global 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 world, right? Yeah. There, there yeah. are these um, influences that perhaps change our communities a lot faster than they might have done in in previous times. Uh, yeah. Also fascinating that um, the colonizers come with suspicion, right? They're, because they're already suspicious of their own communities, and that's what then projected out onto the other communities. Well, I want to bring it. Uh, back to some, some some of the more beautiful points of your book um, and thinking you know looking at the tradition and bringing it back to what was in the Islamic tradition so this bit um, is so beautiful although it comes out of uh, you sharing with your your grandmother guru about um, some painful experiences that you, you had in Germany and her response so this is on uh, page 83 um, and the chapter on the genders of Islam. She said to you, you know, child, whatever people say or do to you, never forget that you belong to the people who hold the keys to the Holy Kaaba in Mecca and to the mosque of the prophet, may peace be upon him and his family in Medina. Now, I know that will be something that will be quite surprising to a lot of people, um, I, I've known about it for not that long, actually. Uh, it might not have been much, much before we had our training with you um, for Ray, um, but I had heard about it. And, and so, you know, the sense that people are always so keen to follow in, in the example of the prophet, and yet there is so much that we have, you know, evidence of that we don't follow in, in, in his footsteps. And I wondered if you could share more, you know, there's so much about the Islamic um, perspective, the history, um, the evidence um, from, from how people were treated in the Prophet's time. Could you speak more to this and, and the effect that it had on you and the support that, you know, you talk about when she, when she shared this with you? Mm. I mean, this institution of the eunuchs at the sacred mosques of Mecca and Medina, that, that's not directly going back to the times of the prophet of course that was an institution that was i think introduced by the mamluk dynasty in medieval times um but it goes back you know it, it has a long even pre-islamic history of of sacred eunuchs we find that in so many societies um both sacred eunuchs also in the sense of of, of castrated males but also in general sacred trans people we 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 find it in almost every traditional society um we, we there is this idea that there's something because trans people or people we would call trans people people who somehow fall in between the gender binaries um they, ha they have a liminality that's the it's an anthropological term you know the liminal liminality and everything that's sacred is also liminal there's also liminality to it everything is uh, we have um, uh, it, it's actually very common to refer to sacred places as thresholds for example the sacred threshold you know the um, the a number of, of very sacred places of Islam in Iraq for example the shrines of Imam Ali and Imam Hussein they are called thresholds and we find that in a lot of cultures so everything that has this character of a threshold is sacred and in some sense people we would call transgender are living and walking thresholds so there is something sacred about them um, and uh, so there was this institution uh, of the eunuch guards at at the holy mosque in mecca and in Medina, and it existed for centuries. And actually, the some of the last eunuchs are still alive, and uh, you you can find videos of them on YouTube. And there has been a, a, a photo essay by a photographer um, on on them. And so this this continued all throughout the modern period. And they were not just guards in in the sense of protectors, but these were people who had very specific uh, ritual functions also of, you know, cleaning the sacred places and um, making sure that everything there was, was um, you know, going on uh, in the right way. Um, 
and they were highly respected by Muslims throughout the centuries, very, very much respected. And we do know that these eunuchs of Mecca and Medina, exactly as the eunuchs in the um, in the Muslim courts, they were they partly were castrated slaves, but they also uh, included these categories of born eunuchs. And we also know, um, I mean, m most of the, in the, in the later age, like, like in more recent centuries, most of these eunuchs came from Africa. Um, and the last eunuchs that still are alive today, they are black. Um, but there was a long period uh, in the late medieval and early modern times when most of the eunuchs of uh, of those holy places actually came from South Asia. So uh, there's a good, I mean, we have good historical indication to think of a connection between the South Asian Khajasara community and uh, and those eunuchs at the holy places of Islam. And indeed, so this is my historical speculation um, but indeed, my uh, the, the the grandmother guru that you just cited, she said yes, we are connected to these people, and um, and people in the Khajasara community actually are very much the, the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca means a lot to them. And traditionally, if you want to be a respected member in the Khajasara community, you have to do the Hajj, you have to do the pilgrimage, and so. The older gurus, the older teachers in the community, they always used to tell me that when they went on Hajj, they had been in contact with these eunuchs there. Um, so even until very recent time, th there was some kind of direct connection, even though this is not something that's publicly known or well acknowledged. And it will surprise people because, of course, these um, these these eunuch guards of the holy cities look very different from from people in the Khaja Sara community. People in the Khaja Sara community, people usually wear female or feminine clothes. They wear makeup. They wear wear jewelry. While these eunuchs at the at the sacred places, um, they they wear very heavy authoritarian uniforms. You know, they don't wear. Uh, female dress or anything like that. So at first sight, they might be something very different, but the connection is there and it is well known within the community. Um, apart from that, uh, the, we have so many sources that talk about the presence of, of people we would call transgender in Medina at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and in his community. And actually, while, while there are some reports that may indicate uh, a critical attitude of the Prophet to these people, and of course, these reports are always used and instrumentalized for transphobic purposes, but the larger picture of all the indications that we have and all the reports we have is actually that they were a part of the community. They were there, you know, and unless there was a specific reason to ostracize them, they were not ostracized. And in fact, even in the Quran, it is mentioned that uh, uh, th there is a class of, of servants um, who are described as, as born male, but without any male characteristics and and these servants are actually allowed to go into the private com you know the the private rooms of the women and women are are allowed to to move freely in front of them and not worry about anything just as they would move freely in front of women in front of cis women and that is clearly mentioned in the quran um and so um in many ways, this is already it's 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 a root for this this idea of, of of the eunuch that emerged later in Islam. At the same time, we definitely know that those people at that time of the Prophet were not castrated. So in that case, it's it's definitely the, the Prophet did not allow castration at all, um, and, and and so the the category 
uh, that is referenced there is definitely one that that means people who we would call trends today. And the early commentators of the Quran, they say so, actually. And it's only, only modern commentators of the Quran who are confused by this category and who are like, okay, what are we talking about? And then you even you have some modernist commentators who say, well, maybe, maybe, maybe this verse is talking about old men who due to their old age have become impotent and so they are no threat for women anymore. You know, so it's the, the modern Muslim has an issue with these, uh, th this, this verse of the Quran, the classical commentators very clearly most of them were very clear about which category of people was meant there. Yeah, I mean, I was so um, kind of blown away by you list all these, you know, well-known classical scholars, and then you give what, you know, their, their kind of perspectives on it, and they're just not what I would have expected. But because there is this implicit trust in that, if, you know, you believe when somebody says what they are, why would you not believe them? And until things, you know, become like th there's a reason to investigate, you just accept what is being presented to you. Well, there was some kind of biology, bi what you call biologization in classical Islam as well, you know, because you had you had scholarly discussions about intersex people and how you could define the real gender of an intersex person. Um, and uh, but but that in itself is interesting that religious scholars would 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 deal with subjects like this you know i mean we in our societies nowadays we only very recently have come to the point where we openly discuss these things and are willing to address the fact that there are people whose whose physical characteristics may not easily be categorized as either male or female um, Muslim scholars were talking about it already in, in medieval times and were, were struggling with it. And, um, but it's also, it, it's interesting if we, if we look at the data in that context as well, what we find is that there was no, you know, that there was no rule that was accepted by all scholars. There was no clear dogma on, on this issue. You had, um, you, you had, uh, proclamations where the identity of a person was very easily accepted uh, based on what that person themselves said they are. Uh, but you also had scholars who were more critical of that. You had all kinds of of opinions on this subject. You had you had um, speculations on how you could somehow determine the true gender of a person and and this included such things as uh, counting the ribs of a person, you know, because according to uh, Christian, Jewish and Muslim mythology, um, women were created from a rib of Adam. And so accordingly, men should have less ribs than women, you know, obviously that's nonsense, you know, we know it doesn't work like that, but, but scholars came up with these kind of ideas um, and maybe they came up with these kind. Maybe the scholars who did say so did know that it was nonsense, but they just came up with these ideas because they thought they needed to tell people something. But in the end, just you, you know, let let people live as they want to live and not bother too much about it. <laughs> yes, so scholars always have to feel they have to have an answer for for everything. Yeah, um, yeah. But there was more diversity it, though back then, I think. It was not so regulated. I mean, we have to understand that a lot of the, the high regulation that we see uh, in Islam nowadays is not just based on Islam as such, but is also based on modernity, you know? And um, just such things as, you know, the hot topic that we're discussing now in, in the UK, but also in Germany, you know, how should a person be allowed to or should a person be allowed to have their gender changed officially and and um, who should be allowed to do so and so on and so on. This is a very modern concern because only in modernity, we have this idea of an official gender um, that's somehow an intrinsic 
part of state bureaucracy and it's it's written down somewhere in some big computer i guess and and you know it can't be changed that easily that is not how people in pre-modern times lived you know um you either were accepted by your community or you were not and if your village accepted that you were just this odd person who didn't fit into the gender binary and and you you were not harming anybody and uh, you 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 just live as you want to then the village accepted that and there was no higher um there there, there was no no state bureaucracy who would have meddled with that and uh, and also this the muslim scholars wouldn't have had any reason to meddle with that unless unless something happens um and this this thing would be brought in front of a court which happens sometimes we have for example cases we have several cases from the ottoman empire where um there's one case that's actually very sad. We know of um, of an intersex person uh, who was married to a man and the intersex person uh, herself identified as a woman and that was accepted and they got married, but um, somebody else was actually jealous of the situation. Some other man was actually in love with that intersex person, couldn't bear the fact that she was married to another man, and so she brought this whole subject in front of in in, in front of of a court, um, and said, "Well, this person is not actually a woman and should not actually be married." You know, just out of spite, out of jealousy, you know. And then the the judge, the scholar, looked at it and 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 passed a ruling on this. Um, there's I unfortunately I forgot the the scholar who has written about this case, but there's some some good academic literature on this. And I meant in my book I, I mentioned the name of the scholar actually. So these things happen. Sometimes these issues are brought to court for a specific reason, for example, because some stupid man is jealous. Um and then it has consequences in the in the Sharia court. But unless that happens, it's just not an issue for the Muslim scholar. Thank you, Leila. Um, I have a question in chat and also realizing we're coming toward the end of, uh, oh my of God, our hour. <laughs> yes, I know. It's amazing. Like I said, it always zooms by. Um, yeah. So the question is that, um, Leila, you spoke beautifully at one of the Ray Fests. I think it might have been last year. Um, about the connection between um, uh, non-binary slash third gender people and angels. And could you say a little bit more about that? I think that it was actually during the conversation with Rachel. Um, and we were taught, I mean, I mean, something that we all have in common as, um, as, as queer or trans people, in in the so-called abrahamic religious traditions is that always the story of loot of sodom and gomorrah is, is thrown at us and it's said that you well you you, you know you are these uh, you are these rapists who are depicted in this story it's a story about it's very clear what we see in this story it's uh, um, a mob of people who demand that they can do violence to uh to to any guest that comes into this society. Um, and um, it is claimed that this says something essential about people who have some kind of variant gender or sexual orientation. Um, but I, I think the situation is quite different. The situation is that um, so what happens in that story, whether we look at the uh, at the Jewish and Christian scriptures or at, at how it is described in the Quran, is that then God sends these angels to uh, to loot alayhi salam to the prophet, and they pose as guests to basically to provoke this mob, uh, but also to give loot this message of okay, you have to leave this society now. You cannot live with these people and um and uh and and that is exactly what happens so these angels come into 
this society and then the the mob um it attacks the house of loot and says bring them out and give them to us we want to do to these to these to your guests your guests have no right of protection we want to do with them whatever we want to do and uh, we want to rape them and um as a as a queer and trans person in this world i i must say i usually do not find myself as a part of a mob that wants to do violence to other people, but I very, very often find myself on the other side. I am usually the person who is afraid of these mobs who want to do violence to me. Um, and uh, that realization made me, made me understand that um, in, in many ways, we, we, are, we are not the people of loot. We are much more like the angels in that story and also in that sense that of course angels come to this world to to give us a new understanding of something to ask us questions and to make us ask ourselves questions and i do i do see so often that our pure existence as trans people in this world does the very same thing to um to people they start to wonder they they look at you and they oh what is that a man is that a woman what does that say about my my own gender my own sexuality and of course that is often what you know what leads to that mob violence because people cannot deal with these questions and they rather deal with it with anger and violence and then the other thing is and this is actually also something that i've been told in in my i mean in the in the Khaja Sara community is in islam at least angels are very very clearly described as neither male nor female it's a very important uh, thing in in islam actually and so there is this idea that uh, that that people of the khaja sara community not that they are angels but there is something angelic about them they are like the uh, some people say they're the birds of paradise. There's something because wh when you are neither male nor female, then you have you have some kind of quality. Uh, you you bring some kind of quality from a different world to this world and make people question the reality of this world. Oh, Leila, thank you so much. What a what a beautiful way, I think, to um, to end that. Thank you for the question. That was that was a wonderful conclusion. I just want to say thank you so much for being part of our journey, for sharing uh, yourself, and I wanted just um, to end with the dedication that you put at the beginning of your book because I just when I read it, I just thought this is how I would like to end the session, and so you say, uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, seven eight six. For my parents, we've been, we've been through a lot, but I am glad that we've made it. And for all the young trans people who go through a lot right now, it will get better. Inshallah, God willing, it will get better. Thank you so much, Leila, for joining us. Thank you so very grateful. Much. Thank you.